All right, folks, this is Thomas Keegan with uh, LibertarianProgressive.com, blogtalkradio.com, forward slash election channel. We have another interview for you. We're going to have 50-plus interviews this year with candidates who are on the ballots and the only alternate choice besides the Republicans and the Democrats this November 8th election season. LibertarianProgressive.com is an independent media organization. We interview independent third-party candidates excuse me, who are on the ballot. If We believe if a candidate has gathered enough signatures to be on the ballot or got on the ballot and has a statistical chance to win, then a responsible media will include them in the debates and interview them to educate and inform the public of their options. So um, there are options besides Republican and Democrat contenders. Um, there's, uh, it's up to you to you know, bring that competition to... Um, the lights here and uh so right now we're going to interview alan buckley libertarian for the u.s senate in georgia running as a libertarian i'm going to give him a call right now i believe he's um uh driving here so we'll just conduct this friendly interview over the phone hello Hi, Mr. Buckley, Alan Buckley. This is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com, um, blogtalkradio.com forward slash election channel. And I already just gave you an um, introduction before we called in here, but uh, we do thank you for taking the time to conduct this interview and to enlighten our audience about their choices besides the Republican and, and the Democrats' uh, regular status quo choices. Right. Great to be on. All right. And people can... Um, visit your website here it's uh buckley for senate.com b-u-c-k-l-e-y-f-o-r senate s-e-n-a-t-e.com and so the most substance sub substantive question that i can ask you is about your issues and i believe on your home page actually um you have the issues listed right there but uh you have everything from reducing regulation tax reform entitlements federal pay military intervention, audit the Fed, illegal immigration, the national debt, balanced budgets, judges, health care, the environment, and the infrastructure, and personal choice. Um, you know, if, uh, well, let me ask you this first. Why did you decide to run as a libertarian instead of a Republican or Democrat? And I believe you are the only third option for the state of Georgia in the Senate race. Is that correct? Right, right. There'll be three people on the ballot, the Republican, the the Democrat, me. This is actually the third time I've run. I ran in 2004, and I ran in 2008. 2008, it went to a runoff between the Republican and the Democrat um, in Georgia to win in the general election. You need to get more than 50% of the vote, and no one did that in the general election. So. I think there's a good chance this election will go to a runoff as well. It's a question of who will be in it. And, you know, my obvious goal is to get in. And if I, if I get in it, I think I can win the race uh, because it would be between the runoff would be between a major party candidate and a libertarian. And I think I would get tremendous support from ac- across the country and even, even across the globe at that point uh, to get someone in other than a major party candidate. So, um, you know, as you mentioned, I've got, I cover a lot of topics on my website. Actually, all of those topics you talk about, if you just punch on them, they link to a long page that's called Solutions to Problems, where I, I, I cover basically all the all the major issues that the country faces and then propose solutions. And, uh, you know, the, the major problem, the greatest problem of all is our uh, potentially catastrophic financial situation with uh, debts eventually, as the GAO would say, spiraling out of control. They said that they foresaw that in 2007. Since then, in nine years, the total debt has more than doubled. It went from under $9 trillion then to almost $20 trillion now. And there's no end in sight with all these baby boomer entitlements coming due over the next 13 years. So uh, you know, I offer hope. I offer solutions to the problems. A greatly simplified tax system that forces balanced budgets using algebra. And uh, I spent two years coming up with that tax proposal. I'm an attorney and a CPA, 
so I do a good amount of tax work and pension work and state planning type work. I know the tax system pretty well. I'm 55, so I've been at it roughly 30 years. And, um, so, I mean, I, like I said, I don't duck any of the issues. I, I was on a radio call this morning with a uh, radio station out of Rome, Georgia, and the guy was already familiar with my stance on the financial issues. He wanted to talk about social issues, and I was I was fine with that. You know, he asked me what my position was on abortion, and uh, I know I know he was a I knew he was a social conservative, and you know, I said, look, you know, I'm to keep the government and taxpayer money out of abortion. Let people do what they're going to do, but let them pay for whatever it is they're going to do. And uh, so, I mean. That, that's my stance. I told him, and uh, I think when I explained it, I think he could appreciate it. So uh, we'll see. I mean, uh, the, the incumbent here in Georgia, Johnny Isaacson, is in his 70s. He's, he's basically just a politician. He doesn't come up with anything creative. He, the main thing he has going for him is he's a nice guy, and everybody knows him. He's a nice guy. And, uh, he's got a terrible voting record, though. The conservative review gives him a... 32 out of 100 of solid F, and uh, the Heritage Foundation gives him a solid F of 51, but he goes around telling everyone he's a conservative, and uh, so I've also been going after him on his debt record. He tells everybody he never voted for a tax increase, but he voted for things like the war in Iraq, uh, expansion of Medicare, no child left behind, etc., that, that lead to tremendous spending increases, and then when the tab comes in, he says, well, I don't vote for tax increases, so just put it on my tab. And he votes for debt. He's voted for over tr $7 trillion of debt. So we nailed him on the on that in the AJC. That's the Atlanta newspaper, Atlanta Journal and Constitution. They did a truth or meter article where I said he had voted for more than seven. I said he voted for $7 trillion of debt. He's actually voted for more than that. But they they said it was mostly true. They have this scale from, you know, pants on fire lie all the way to totally true and the only reason it wasn't totally true, it was, it was completely true that he voted for that amount. He tried to claim that there were some justifications. He couldn't help it and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, we pointed out that, um, you know, he voted for all these things that would ne necessitate either a tax increase or or debt, and he voted for debt. So, Yeah, Alan, that's a very good point. I mean, debt, um, you know, some people could – some things might be concerned in investment, but other things are just going to collect interest and um, actually be counterproductive, and so it could be worse than taxes. Um, and that's interesting about Georgia needing over the 50% plateau and, um, and that the whole world might be interested because, yes, you would be affecting um, policy uh, throughout the entire United States, which would affect the world. Um, actually, I do have a list of questions here. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, if we could um, just hear your stance on some of these, like what about – accountability and transparency um what would you uh where would you uh place um you, you know what would be your reforms or your thoughts or your policies regarding accountability and transparency well accountability i mean again you start with the tax system that forces balanced budgets and you know the state and local governments have to balance their budgets so if we went to a tax system that used algebra to force balanced budgets you'd forced politicians in D.C. to basically make the numbers work. And so they would have to go to their constituents if they voted for a, uh, a spending increase to produce a higher tax rate. Um, <clears throat> as far as transparency, you know, I would be as transparent as possible. Um, you know, there's only so much you're going to do up there in D.C. Um, in terms of you know, getting getting the administration to be more transparent. I mean, I think that's very difficult. But, I mean, I would be as transparent as possible. I have an AV rating from Martindale Hubble. I've had it for 20 years. That's the highest possible for attorneys in terms of work quality and ethics. And I wouldn't be going up there to be creating hidden agendas. I'd be up there to try to solve problems. So. Yeah, and you would have a platform where you could possibly – you know, learn some things and uh, bring them to light um, as well because of that. And what about um, the justice system? I uh, have any thoughts right now that you could share with us about your thoughts on the current state of the justice system? Well, we do incarcerate 
you know, more people than any country. We have about 5% of the world's population, but I think we have more than 20% of the world's prisoners, which is not prudent. I mean, we've got a, there's been a number of articles written recently, including one by the Economist magazine that I have on my website. It says we've got to, we've got to get a different ratio of incarceration to rehabilitation than we've got now. We've, we've locked people up too long, and the Republicans and Democrats put together this system back in the 90s, and it's um, it's not working well. And so we've, that's got to be changed. As far as uh, you know, as far as judges, if you're talking about the justice system, I mean, I think we need to point judges who try to interpret the intent of the drafters of the legislation and issue, whether it's the Constitution or a statute, and, uh, you know, not try to uh, shape the law or change it for current conditions. If you don't like the law, go through the procedure to get it changed, and statute is through Congress, and the Constitution is through the state. So, and it's obviously a much more laborious process, but the Bill of Rights was created for a reason, and it was made intentionally to be difficult to take away those rights. So um, I think we need to get the right judges in there. I, I I have to litigate with the federal government, and I see a tremendous amount of favoritism towards the federal government by the judges, particularly when significant money is at issue. They, um, You know, a lot of these judges, to be frank, view their role as not protecting the Constitution, even though that's the oath they take. They view their role as protecting the federal government, and that's very different. So, I mean, if I'm elected, I would go to great lengths to try to make sure we get the right judges in place who have the right priorities in line. So. Right. That sounds good. And feel free to take these questions, you, you know, however um, you want to, uh, t- you know, expand on them. What about um, – election reform do you think there's um you know do we do we need any election reform um federally in this country right now well you know i'm okay with the individual limits on donations i'm fine with citizens united and and allowing you know corporations to uh say what they want i mean uh two individuals an individual can have their own corporation why should the individual be able to speak but not the corporation um, you know, I, I really am having a problem with this whole debate thing with, you know, Gary Johnson and Bill Weld and the two major party <clears throat> candidates, uh, particularly when the independents are posting the highest percentage. They're, I think the independent voters are – the percentage of people who call themselves independent is greater than – the number of people in the Republican or the Democratic parties now, or or people who claim that they're, they're Republican or Democrat. So um, I, I just think we we need to get any sort of significant third party candidate. And I don't know about I just don't think this 15 percent is, you know, I think it should be lower. If they we're going to set a standard, it should be lower than that. I mean, maybe it's 10. I don't know. I understand the point of not getting people in who are you know, getting one or two percent, then it's not really worth it. But um, you know, Gary Johnson has polled in a lot of polls over ten percent, and you know, getting him in there will give a very different and fresh perspective than you're going to get from hearing, you know, Trump and Hillary just bash each other and avoid issues. So, yeah, that's a good point. He's the only candidate um, who's on fifty ballots, and uh, you know, at this point in the 1992 season Ross Perot was at about the same percent and after the debates at one time he actually had a higher um he was higher up in the polls than um the first George Bush and and Bill Clinton until he dropped out and then came back in what about um small and mid-sized businesses uh what are your uh some of your thoughts and um issues regarding small and and mid-sized businesses for the U.S.? Well, there's too much regulation, There's and the tax system needs to be greatly simplified so they can understand it and they can plan. And, again, I, I propose a very simple tax system that basically eliminates well, it eliminates the income tax altogether, the corporate and the, and the individual income tax. It adds a consumption tax with an X rate and takes the current FICA slash self-employment tax 
and installs an X-rate for the FICA tax and a 2X rate for the for the uh, self-employment tax. So X is whatever is necessary to balance the budget. And you have five credits against the FICA slash self-employment tax that basically cause lower income and middle income people not to be subjected to that tax. You have a credit for poverty, a credit for basic home mortgage interest, a credit for health care, a credit for charity, and a credit for basic retirement savings. And basically say the upper half of middle income people and above will pay that tax, but everybody will pay the consumption tax. And again, the, the rates are tied to spending to balance the budget. So you've got a progressive system that forces a balanced budget. And basically the way I've created this thing, it, it uh, discourages offshoring of jobs because basically every corporation becomes an S corporation, which means all of its earnings are, are tax-free to the corporation, but they flow through to the shareholders and are taxed on the shareholders' uh, individual um, tax bases as self-employment income, so subject to the 2x rate. Um, now, here's the idea that I think is key. What you do is for, it doesn't matter where your corporation is headquartered, so inversions where people, where corporations move their headquarters overseas, that gets nixed because it doesn't matter where your headquarters are. You take U.S. sales divided by worldwide sales of the entity and multiply that percent times the profit. And so if the profit's a billion dollars and 40% of your sales from the U.S., then $400 million gets taxed to the U.S. regardless of where the shareholders are located, whether they're in the U.S., in Saudi Arabia, France, et cetera. Each shareholder pays tax on his or her pro rata share of the worldwide income. So that and basically what you also say to discourage sending jobs overseas, you say to the extent your foreign sales are, excuse me, your your foreign labor costs are disproportionate to your foreign sales percent. Uh, you can't get a deduction. So let me give you an example. Let's say a company has 60% of its sales here, but only 10% of its payroll. Well, the differential is 60 minus 10 is 50. So 50% 50 of the company's total worldwide payroll would not be deductible when it computes its net income. Anyways, that's how it works. I know that sounds a little complex, but actually compared to the current system, it is ungodly simple. Um, and as, as far as regulation, I, you know, I fight the federal government uh, as part of my job. I got a class action up in D.C. right now that I'm co-counsel on uh, against the U.S. government, and uh, it involves the Obama administration charging people to do tax returns, and they just... Hold on one second. Sure, sure, absolutely. Okay, okay. All right. Um, basically, they just started charging people to do tax returns out of nowhere, and I do some tax returns, and I started getting charged, and I just – I did some research at the library in 2011, concluded I don't think they can do this, ended up bringing a lawsuit that was dismissed. Anyways, I'm in my fourth lawsuit now over the matter, and it's a, now it's a class action up in D.C., I think we're probably going to win, um, but it's going to take a couple more years. But there's, you know, two to three hundred million dollars involved that, where the Obama administration is just sucking user fees out of people. But, you know, that's that's the um, the new frontier. Just so people know, is um, the government is trying to find ways to raise revenue that's politically acceptable. They don't want to tax people because then it's pretty obvious that they raise their taxes. So what they're doing is they're taking away people's rights and then returning them in exchange for user fees. And an example is for years and years, anybody's been able to prepare tax returns. Well, Obama 2009 gets, a, gets inaugurated, elected in 2008. He hires a guy who was the CEO of H&R Block in 2007 at the Treasury Department creates regulations out of the blue to eliminate H&R Block's competition and at the same time to start charging people to do tax returns. So this right that had always existed because Congress had never taken away the right was now taken away without any statutory authority to do so. And then the right to give to pay returns was given back in exchange for annual fees. Well, that'd be fine if Congress did that, but Congress never set up any sort of system 
that allowed uh, the Treasury, the IRS, to do that. So um, most of the regime has already been struck down by a case called Loving versus uh, Commissioner. And um, so uh, a regulatory regime was set up that was struck down. Now, right now, I'm going after the fees. I've been going after them for years. But um, what, what I was going to say is so I, I've put together a two-page bill that's on my website called the Balance of Powers Restoration Act. And what it says is not only are executive orders void, but it also says if regulations are created and they are struck down in court and the court rules that there was not substantial justification for the regulations, and that exists basically when the agency goes beyond its allotted power, beyond the power granted by Congress, then what happens in that case is the government is liable for attorney fees. And, and, and in this case that I've been talking about, the other part that was already struck down, the government had to pay $300,000 in attorney fees. So my position would be in my, in my bill, it says if that happens, you're personally liable head of the agency who signed off on those regulations that were struck down by a court and found to be without substantial justification. You're liable to the greater of the amount of the fees or 10% of your net worth. And the reason I have the greater of is because you want to prevent presidents from hiring rich people who don't care about paying three hundred thousand dollars. So that's a that's a solution with teeth that works. And we've got to get the executive branch under control. It's it's much it was always meant to be the most powerful branch of government, but it was never meant to have the amount of power that it has. Uh what the power it has it's clearly beyond what was ever envisioned by the founding fathers, and we've got to get get it back to where it was meant to be. And you know, having the veto power is very strong. But that was supposed to be the main power of the president, not uh, and, and the ability to sign, you know, enacted uh, approved bills in the law. So, anyways. I know that's kind of long-winded, but those are my thoughts. Yeah, well, those are very, very important, interesting issues. I mean, of your um, consumption or sales tax proposal, it's very interesting. People can um, get more information at uh, buckleyforsenate.com. And then that last um, you know, type of regulation from H&R Block, that, that, that's very interesting. I, I did not fully um, know about that. Uh, what, about, um, what about foreign policy? What's... Um, you know, where do you stand regarding our foreign policy? Well, we have about 800 foreign military bases when the rest of the world combined has less than 60. I think that's insane, and we're broke. We've got huge financial problems. Um, Let's put it this way. If if the Chinese try to put a military base on Cuba or or in Florida, people here would go crazy. We We just couldn't imagine it. Yet we just assume the rest of these, the rest of the people around the world uh, accept and even like us being there. Um, and we pay leases to have these bases. So, and we're broke. So, uh, you know, I think we need to eliminate half the foreign bases. Again, the rest of the world combined is less than 60. We have about 800. If we cut it down to 400, we'd still have twice. We'd have six to seven times as many of the rest of the world combined. Um, we, we need to get away from this regime change uh, mentality. I think, you know, Gary Johnson's hits, hits the, hit, the nail on the head there. That uh, that's we've got to get away from those procedures. Um, you know, we just need to have a much smarter foreign policy. And, we, and you know, two wars that I think were a disaster. Uh, where the negatives greatly exceeded the positives were Vietnam and Iraq. And uh, Iraq is what got me off the bench and got me, you know, involved in politics in the first place. I just thought it would result in a lot of death of innocent people, and uh, which it did, would make our terrorism problems a lot worse, which it did, and, and make our financial problems a lot worse, which it did. So... Um, you know, so that's where uh, those are my main ideas: is, is is less is less is more, and we save money, 
And I always want to have the strongest military by far, and we've got that now by far. We spend about what the rest of the world combined spends on, on our military. So, um, you know, those are my, 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 my main thoughts. And fighting terrorism has got to be done. It's going to take many years. It's not going to be, you know, an overnight type thing. My opponent here, Johnny Isaacson, appears to want to go on a crusade throughout the Middle East, you know, with a bunch of other countries. But that's not going to work. I mean, uh, you know, uh, these terrorists are going to be hiding in mosques and schools with kids. And it's just, it's not a, uh, it's not like, you know, uh, landing on uh, Okinawa and you're fighting the Japanese military and that's it. It's just a whole different equation that requires a lot more thought and a lot more intelligence, both, you know, brain intelligence and, uh, you know, the intelligence in the spying community. And, uh, and uh, I'm mainly talking about spying on foreigners there. As far as people in, in our country should always need to get a warrant to be able to spy on somebody. So. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that was another question I was going to ask. Well, we have time for just two more things. I want to ask you, is there any local issues that you want to bring up, anything that we haven't mentioned here? And then I'm, I'll ask you the final question after that. Any upcoming events and, and things like that? Well, I mean, there's there's no real local issues. I'm running for a federal office, so I'm not going to delve into local issues. I mean, we've got some things in the ballot. But, um, you know, the, the big the big problem I've got is the Democrat and the and the uh, Republican don't want to debate. And uh, the Democrat wanted to debate, but only the Republican. Now the Democrat wants to debate me because the Republican, Isaacson, won't debate. He's, you know, in his 70s, he's got some health issues, and he's got a – terrible voting record so but that's my problem that i'm trying to work through here with um the media and whatnot as of right now there's only one scheduled debate i mean if i can debate him four times i think i win and i think he knows that so um you know he's doing everything he can to stay out of the limelight taking special interest groups money and running commercials telling everybody how great he is so well, it kind of reminds me of um, like a Rocky movie or something. I mean, if um, not to compare boxing to politics, but if you know, if you challenge someone who claims to be you know the incumbent, the uh, you know the champion, and um, and if they keep getting challenged by someone you, you know who's on the ballot, who the public pays to have on the ballot um, with taxpayer dollars, and and if they refuse to debate, then they're kind of um, you know kind of by technical knockouts. Uh, you know, forfeiting um, the, the race, or at least there could be a case made for that. Um, but um, so let me ask you this. Who are some of your favorite people, past or present, elected or not? Favorite people, uh, past or present, elected or not? Um, you know, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that question. Uh, you know, I really admired Abraham Lincoln. The only, you know, there were a few negatives about him that, um, uh, I think he really loved the country uh, for whatever reason. Uh, you know, um, you know there were, there's a few things that he did that I had a problem with, and I, I think that he probably struggled with. But, but overall, I think he was one of the top two presidents. Um, you know, and other than that, I don't really uh, – no one that you would know that uh, I can think of that I really um, – um, you know, I, I'm sure I can think of somebody, but after we get off the phone, <laughs> that's a good question. No, I've never really. Been like that. Yeah. Well, Abraham Lincoln, that so. that was a good answer there, and that's um, you, you know, that was your first answer there um at this moment. So we do appreciate that, and Alan, we appreciate you taking the time to um, you, you know, to answer all these questions and uh, be in depth, so you know the people can see. Um, in people in Georgia, people in the U.S., people in the world can see what other options that we have, and um, and that there is competition here uh, besides just Coke and Pepsi or Republicans and Democrats. And um, so good to talk to you today. And actually, maybe I shouldn't use Coke and Pepsi. I know Coca Cola is in a uh, in headquartered out of Georgia there, but uh, anyways, yeah. um, we, we appreciate your time today, and and. Uh, and thank you very much, and good luck in your campaign. And um, people can yeah, thanks. Any, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Anybody can provide.
some financial support. It would be greatly appreciated. You know, so far I've loaned money in my campaign. I'd like to at least break even. I told my wife I wouldn't lose any money in the campaign, so any financial support would be appreciated. Sounds excellent. Yeah, they, that's that would be an investment into the future. Um, you probably say, all right, well, good to talk to you, Alan. And uh, Buckley for FOR Senate dot com is where to find more information uh take care and i hope you have a nice evening thanks sir okay you too okay thank you